Well, bless your heart. <laughs> well, we are in Texas. I'm Missy. I'm Micah. And today we have another episode of Curious Tales. I don't know if y'all have had the chance to catch our first episode on Typhoid Mary. If you haven't, go check it out. And um, if you have, good. You're on episode two. Congratulations. And you can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under Curious Tales Podcast. Today, we have the Curious Tale of Madeline Murray O'Hare. Dun, dun, dun. And look, I'm not reading. It's all her. This is her case. I, I don't remember anything, so. Yeah. Oh, also the song that you heard earlier. Oh, yes. I just wanted to give a shout out to a really good friend who made it for this podcast. They go by the artist name of Silver Dusk. She is super amazing. She's so, amazing. She is. On to the case. Well, that always comes to mind, of course. But the most important thing, I think, is that this is their problem. I'm not involved in those emotional, heated ideas. Uh, I'm involved in an intellectual pursuit of uh, specific problems in our society. And that's it. The, um, it's an exciting intellectual experience. And it's very exciting to uncover the facts that are necessary never told anywhere but i there's no sense in getting angry about it there's no sense in reacting to anger i would be down the drain if i did immediately tomorrow and it's their problem people who hate are in great trouble and i'm sorry for those people who hate so badly but i don't hate anybody that was madeline o'hare at one point called the most hated woman in america now some of you may know who she is others might not i didn't know who she was until we started at this. Madeline Murray O'Hare is most famous for two things. One, being an atheist, and two, being a catalyst that got prayer, or at least the teachers being able to lead prayer and Bible readings in school because it was unconstitutional. They led prayer? Yeah. Being able to lead prayer? So Madeline Marie O'Hare stopped them from doing that. She didn't technically stop them. The Supreme Court did. She took a case to the Supreme Court. Her case and another case merged together. The Supreme Court ruled, I think, eight to one, that it was unconstitutional. I mean, you can still pray in school if you want to. You, you can? Know. Yeah. Oh. Because it's your individual choice, but it's not because it's a public school. It's that separation of church and state. Private schools don't count. Yeah, private schools don't count. Cool. So, that's a little bit of background. Madeline Murray O'Hare was born Madeline Mays on April 13th, 1919 to Lena, Christina, and John Irwin Mays. She was born in Pittsburgh and she had a pretty upper middle class upbringing at the age of four. She was baptized into her father's Presbyterian church. Now, her mother was Lutheran. What I've read is they weren't like super religious, but it was a part of her life. 1920 rolled around and we all know what happened in 1929 right you know what happened in 1929 really I'm asking for the viewers. The stock market crash of 1929. Oh, the depression. Yeah, following by the Great Depression. Okay. So her cushy little upper middle class upbringing came to a very, very abrupt end. After that, her father took a series of whatever jobs he could. The family moved around. She spent a lot of her childhood moving from one place to another. In 1934, he moved the family to Ohio to take a job at a Ford plant near Toledo. So, Ohio? Yeah, hey, Ohio. Hey, that's where my 
family's from? Well, my mom's side and my dad's side. She does wind up moving back there later. Madeline says that it was around the age of 12 that she had sort of an aha moment that brought her to atheism. And this is a quote from her. It was then that I was introduced to the Bible. We were living in Akron and I wasn't able to get to the library. So I had two things to read at home, a dictionary and a Bible. Well, I picked up the Bible and I read it from cover to cover one weekend, just like it were a novel, very rapidly. And I've never gotten over the shock of it. The miracles, the inconsistencies, the improbabilities, the impossibilities, the wretched history, the sordid sex, the sadism in it, the whole thing shocked me profoundly. I am going to go ahead and give like a warning. Some of the things I do talk about later on in this case are gruesome. Graphic. She, so, she was a very interesting woman who put a lot of hate and rage out there in the world towards herself. Not really she did it, but other people hated her so much. It was gruesome, guys. She graduates high school in 1936. She goes to like one college in Toledo for about a year. Her family keeps moving. So she's not able to get like a solid college education right away. Well, that sucks. In 1941, she elopes with a man named John Henry Ross. Then World War II happens. Both of them enlist in the military. Her husband gets shipped off somewhere. I didn't really look up where because he's not important to this narrative. She joined the Women's Army Corps and was stationed in Italy as a cryptographer. So in April of 1945, that's when she's posted there. Sometime around this time, she meets a man by the name of William J. Murray Jr. His last name's Murray. His last name's Murray, oh, yes. So they, they fall in love and get married. You would think so, but no. No? But she no. has his last name. Yeah, she has his last name because she just takes it. She begins a relationship with William J. Murray. And at some point, she becomes pregnant. He's a Roman Catholic. Even though she's pregnant, he won't leave his wife because Catholics don't believe in divorce. I think they're much more loose about that a little bit now. Depends on the congregation, I guess. I guess so. Is that the right word? Congregation? Yes, that is the right word. Good use of your vocabulary. <laughs> now, okay, this is my thought. I feel like it is a possibility that because of the fact that she had some feelings for this guy, she's carrying this guy's child, but he won't leave his wife and marry her because of his religion. This could have been a contributing factor coupled with other things that she's had in her life. If psychologically I could see it as it is a factor, but I don't think it would be like the Breaking no, point. it's not like the breaking point, but just a contributing factor. She's pregnant. She's like discharged from the army. She goes back home to Ohio. May 25th, 1946, she gives birth to her first son, who she names William J. Murray III. Oh, so she gave her son the last. Did he agree that that was his child, though? I don't think it mattered. She just went back home and was like, bye. And she just named her baby. That's how she speaks is bye. 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 Oh, no. She went back home. She had her son. Her husband came came back and he's like okay, I know you're either pregnant or you've given birth to this kid. I know it's not mine, but I still want to try to work it out. She's like, no. So she Wait, 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 wait. He was in the military. He leaves for a little while, comes back and his wife is pregnant. And he was her... okay with it? Well, he still wanted to make the marriage work, but she's like, no. Wow. That's harsh. She divorces him. Yeah. Instead of going back to her maiden name, she takes the name Murray. She never married William J. Murray II. But that's the last you hear of William J. Murray II. I wonder how William J. Murray thought about that when he heard her on the, the news. You know, even though she wasn't married to this guy, I tell you, she took this name because it was the principal of the fact. Okay. After she moved back home to Ohio, she goes to college. She completes a bachelor's degree from Ashland University. She then goes on to get a law degree in 1952 from South Texas College of Law. She never actually passed the bar exam. I don't know why she never actually passed the bar exam. But she did have a background in law. I've heard that over the years she worked as a social worker and other things before. It was also common for her to kind of go from job to job. Right. Now she herself says that at one point she worked like a social services department for like 12 or so years and then she got the boot after the whole school prayer. Again, her narrative, I, I couldn't find one way or another. Okay. At this point, she moved to Baltimore, Maryland.
Brooklyn, where her family had finally settled. It is there that she meets and starts a relationship with a man named Michael Ferrello. They carry on for a while. In November 16th of 1954, she gives birth to a second son who she names John Garth Murray. Now, notice she didn't give it the name Ferrello. That guy, I don't know where he is. Reportedly, John Garth never actually met his father. Okay. Even though the first Murray, Murray the second, isn't his father. He's given the last name Murray because that's his mom's last name now. She must have liked this Murray guy, like loved this Murray guy to take his name and then give all of your children that name. And even after she marries her second husband, she still keeps with the name. She's Murray O'Hare. Right. So it must be like almost like a badge of honor for right? her. Right? You know? Here you have this single woman with two kids born out of wedlock in the 1950s. She stuck out. Plus, she has a really strong personality. Like, guys, if you look up interviews, she had a really strong personality. Mr. Withers, is this a form of harassment? No, ma'am. I will leave. I am creating the record. No, you're not creating the record. You are wasting my time. These are... When you're done reading that, call me. I'll be in the ladies' room. Is it your understanding that you have brought the documents today? Call me in the ladies' room when you are done. Saying she had a strong personality is putting it mildly. Yeah. Sometime after the birth of her second son, she joins the Socialist Workers' Party. It's a communist party in the 1950s. This is during the Red Scare. She's a single unwed mother who doesn't believe in God and is a communist. She has this, like, mark on her already. She just stands out. Now, this is where she does something that's really kind of out there. She tries to go to the Soviet Union because their stance, atheism, the national religion, for lack of a better word, it's ingrained in part of their culture. They don't really believe in God, according okay. to my research. She even goes so far as to take her two boys to Paris and try and actually immigrate to the Soviet Union. I I'm not really sure exactly 100% why she was denied. She had worked several jobs, so she did have a bunch of different skills. She also had two young kids. Do you think she would have been accepted if she were just a single woman without any children? It's possible, but also not very many people try to get into Soviet Russia. People were trying to get out of Soviet they, Russia. They didn't know how to react. No, they really didn't. <laughs> Russia basically says, no, that's okay. After this, she takes her boys back home. By now, it's about 1959. 1960. Her oldest son, William, who people call Bill, is now a teenager and he has started at a new high school. This is where Madeline finds her calling. Okay, tell me. Madeline discovers that her son is being made to pray and say the Lord's Prayer in okay. school, led by the teacher. She, which is perfectly legal then. Yes, which is perfectly legal then. Well, actually, it was uh, at the time that my oldest son came home and said that he was being required uh, to listen to the Bible being read and to recite in unison the King James Version, the Protestant Version, of the Lord's Prayer in the public schools. And we went to the public schools in order to make a complaint to the uh, Board of Education, to the principal, uh, exhausting all of the administrative remedies of the school, and finally going into court because we did not like the determination that we had. Uh, and the determination, you might be interested in that, was one, that my son would remain in the classroom Two, that he would assume a reverential position so that he would not offend the religious students in the room. Three, he would move his lips as if he were saying the prayer, again, not to offend the people in the room. Uh, and um, at that point, we felt that better the prayer out than the compulsion of that kind in. So this is Madeline talking about her son praying in school. She tries to appeal to the school to have her son excused as you heard in the clip, wasn't so successful. Um, so she files a lawsuit with the Supreme Court. Her suit is combined with another one. I didn't really look up a whole lot on that one because I was focusing more on Madeline. In 1963, the Supreme Court rules 8-1 to that it is a violation of the Constitution to make kids pray in school. The teachers can no longer lead them in prayer. This leads her to be quite hated because... 
This is 1960s America. Her son is picked on and ridiculed, beaten up, and in one interview he gives later on in his years, he says that his mother used him as a spy, made him keep a journal of what prayers and when and, and whatnot. In 1964, Life magazine declares her the most hated woman in America. She was actually quite proud of this title. Somehow, despite all of this, being ridiculed in school and everything else, Bill manages to get himself a girlfriend. Two years after the ruling, his girlfriend gives birth to his daughter, Robin. Okay. I've read some interesting stuff. They had to move to Texas because there was an incident. The mom of little Robin was underage. She had run away from home and was staying with the Murray O'Hares. Well, her parents called the cops and Madeline assaulted some of the cops to keep them from taking her away. You don't do that. Don't assault the cops. As far as I know, she wasn't charged or anything. She fled with the family. Okay. And they eventually settle in Austin, Texas. What happened to the mom then? You know what? I honestly don't know. Did she have to go back home? I don't know. Um, some places I read said her and Bill married. Mm -hmm. Some places it, she she's not talking about. I think her name was Susan. Okay. If they married, the marriage didn't last very long. Bill develops an alcohol problem, some other issues. Madeline takes custody of the little girl and winds up legally adopting Robin. Also in 1965, Madeline marries again. She marries a man by the name of Richard O'Hare, who was also, a, he was an atheist. He turned people in for being communists. <laughs> He gave a bunch of names to the FBI. Does he know his wife might possibly be one? <laughs> no. Somewhere I read somebody he tried to pretend to be FBI. I don't know mm -hmm. how much of that is actually true. The marriage didn't actually last and the two separated. Aww. But that is, is that how... her second failed marriage? It is. Oh, that's sad. It doesn't end in divorce. He dies in 1978. They're still technically legally married, though they're separated. Oh. But that is how she got the name O'Hare. She gets her adopted daughter granddaughter the last name of O'Hare Robin Murray O'Hare somehow through all of this Madeline Murray O'Hare over the years she continues to file different lawsuits that include things like having In God We Trust removed from money obviously that one didn't work In God We Trust is still in money those were newer things that had been added in like the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. I don't know the exact date I didn't look it up she also tried to have One Nation Under God something that was also newer in time. our Pledge of Allegiance. In our Pledge of Allegiance. Obviously, it didn't work. She tried to have those removed. And this is... I just love this one. She tried to sue NASA because... You don't sue NASA. Wait, you can sue NASA? She tried to sue NASA because of the Apollo 8 landing on the moon they read from the chapter of Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> the Supreme Court denied her case because of lack of jurisdiction because... I'm sorry, but there are no it's the moon. The moon. <laughs> it's the moon. Okay, I don't think that Ooh. the United States State you could technically murder somebody on the moon because there are no laws on the moon. It's perfectly legal. That would be a good defense, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> Getting there. At this point, she trying to sue NASA. But the moon, the Supreme Court, does not have jurisdiction over the moon. Right. That one was denied. All of this has happened. She really equates to Austin. Not everyone has seen her legal suits as a bad thing. Like, the majority of America freaking hate this woman. Right. She's causing trouble everywhere. She is. She's not the only atheist. Well, no. There are closet atheists. But also, I would imagine that not just atheists would like her because there are also people who are well, nowadays, Buddhist and Jewish and Shinto, who wouldn't necessarily want to be praying to God or that God in school. That was also the argument. Yeah. Because, I mean, her words... It was the King James Version of the Bible. The Roman Catholics would be like, well, maybe we want our version of the Lord's Prayer. Or the Jewish people would be like, we don't read that second part of your Bible. Right. We, we only read the first half. Muslims are like, we have an entirely different book. And Same God, different book. What if, like, you believed in Buddha or... <laughs> you know, well, or like the Shinto religion, or like some of the Asian religions. I don't well, know how many of them okay, were there. To, then. to be fair, because um, World War 
too, right? Right. It wasn't At least a good time. Japanese was not a good thing. It wasn't a good time to in be the Japanese. 1950s. I mean, they were just that was one of the reasons why she said it was unconstitutional because it wasn't just her lack of a belief in a god. I could see how it being on American money would be dishonoring some of the American people who do not believe in God. And yet it's still there to this day. So yes. that didn't work. Well, that's because America is mostly a, like a Christian belief. Right. People start sending her money. Okay. So she's literally getting hate mail. Like, you know, die biatch. Don't go biatch. Oh, die bitch. <laughs> poop. Literally mailing her poop. But she gets this idea. And in 1963, she founded American Atheists. Which was actually quite inclusive. Because there were a lot of atheists in the closet who decided they liked her. Right, but see, the thing is... Back on the railway. <laughs> but the thing is, is she actually let people work with her that as long as they were okay with atheists, she didn't care if they were white, black, gay, straight, what? Ex-cons. Ex-cons, which that'll come back to bite her in the ass later. But she was actually very inclusive. She accepted anyone into her inner circle, so long as they were atheists or were okay with atheists. The mission of the American Atheist actually stated... An atheist loves himself and his fellow man instead of a god. An atheist accepts that heaven is something for which they should work here on earth for all men together to enjoy. Now, her open arms would prove to be her ultimate downfall, but we're not quite there yet. She wrote papers for Hustler. She was even interviewed by Playboy in 1965. <laughs> That's interesting. During this interview, she talks about some of the hate mail I mentioned earlier, that she had received photos with literal shit on them. This is a direct quote from a letter she was sent. It's referring to the conversation of Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus. May Jesus, who you so vigorously deny, change you into a Paul. O'Hare told the interview, isn't that lovely? Christine Jurgensen, who was the first transgender woman to have sexual reassignment surgery, had to go to Sweden for an operation, but me, they'll fix it with faith, painlessly and for nothing. <laughs> So, wow. um, she was known to have a very direct way of speaking and she spoke her mind and for the most part she really didn't care whether you liked it or not. Her biographer referred to her as a unique combination of brilliant manipulator and outrageous foul mouthed trouble seeker. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> she did several interviews. She was on the Phil Donahue show. She did Johnny Carson. At one point, she went up against the Reverend Billy Graham, but he's like a really big name minister. She did went up against some other preachers in sort of a God, no God kind of debate. Right. She did all this stuff into the 70s and 80s. Meanwhile, she's promoting atheism. She's continuing different lawsuits. She's raising her granddaughter. She's got her son, John Garth, by her side. And up until 1980, her son, William, was still helping her. He had, at this point, developed alcohol problems from sources I found. He's hitting a real rock bottom. Well, that sucks. I feel bad for at him. At some time around 1980, he starts attending AA meetings. Okay. On Mother's Day in 1980, Bill tells his mom, Mom, I found God. Hey, one that's a really bad day to pick. <laughs> no shit, right? Like, seriously? <laughs> no shit, right? Does she take it well? Here are her words. Her words. One would call this a postnatal abortion on the part of a mother. Well, oh, that's harsh. I guess I repute him entirely and completely. For now and all time, he is beyond human forgiveness, and they never spoke again. I thought she had an open-door policy. Her son betrayed her horribly. How? Well, he did go on to actually make a video later on, and he also gave interviews saying she's a horrible woman. She has led many people to hell. Okay, so he talked very poorly. He her. talked bad about her, and he goes, it's a horrible thing to say about your own mother, but But I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to say it anyway. Okay. And he goes on to become a pastor. Oh, okay. In 1986. So they got some shit going on. So they got some them. shit going on. He's still alive. Oh, is he? As far as I could tell, he hasn't died. But in 1986, 
she turns over the presidency of American Atheist over to her son, John Garth. But this is really making him more of a figurehead, and she's still pretty much the power behind the throne, so to speak. Oh, okay, cool. Into the 90s, and I mean, she's getting on up in years. By now, she's like in her 70s. Right. At some point, she's developed diabetes and other health problems. Here's the interesting thing. Her son... John, her granddaughter Robin, and her all live together. Her son is like 40, and her granddaughter's like 30. Now, this is important. At some point in 1993, she hires a man by the name of David Roland Waters. He's hired as an employee. Now, he was really charming. She came to trust him. Never trust the charming ones. Now, let me tell you a little bit about David Waters, okay? He was a convicted murderer. At the age of 16, he beat someone to death. <laughs> Wait, did she not do a background check? I, I think that they were in a desperate kind of situation. So they just And they him. just, like, he was just charming, like a sociopath, you know? Uh. Oh, beating someone to death is not the worst of his offenses, okay? Okay. He also beats his own mother. To death? No, not to death. Oh, okay. Just beats her. That's still bad. Oh, wait for it. What? He then pees on her. Ew. <laughs> I know, I know. So he's this real charming guy. Just a real stand-up guy. On the surface. <laughs> On the surface. <laughs> Don't do a background check, Madeline. So, at some point in 1993, I found different reasons for it. Some said that they had to go to, I think, San Diego for a lawsuit, and they didn't know how long it was going to be, how long it, the trial or whatever was going to take them. She leaves David Waters in charge as an office manager of the American Atheist office. Well, good old Dave fires everybody. He then proceeds to steal $54,000 from the organization. <laughs> oh my God. I also read in one place that he dumped some of the computers in the river so that they couldn't have access to records and stuff. Oh. Madeline, of course, finds out because when they come back from whatever their business was, the office is abandoned. Because everyone was fired. <laughs> everyone was fired. <laughs> they go about doing damage control. She goes to the cops and it's like, hey, look, this guy stole from me. And they're like, hey, okay, you're an atheist. We don't care. They're like, you're the most hated woman on earth. What do I um, care about you? Oh, I'm sorry. In America. So <laughs> at one point, Waters comes in. I don't know if he turned himself in or what. The cops basically go, they're there. Just pay back the atheist and we'll give you probation. Pat you on the head and send you on your way. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> oh, these cops are not good. They're bad cops. I wait for it. Oh my god. I don't think I'd want to trust them with my murder. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you do not. Waters is given probation and told to pay back the money. Of course, this is not good enough for Madeline. In her magazine, the American Atheist magazine, she writes an article revealing all of his past criminal behavior. All of it. Why would and you do you that, it? though? Because now you're just saying, I didn't do a background check. I hired a criminal. I'm the fool. No, she's, because she's Madeline Murray O'Hara. This is what she does. Okay. She can Accuses him of homosexuality in prison and a whole bunch of other like bad stuff. Like his mom was a prostitute and just, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with prostitutes, you know. Or homosexuality. Or homosexuality, no. Or homosexuality in general. But I mean, she was just trying to really humiliate this guy. Okay. And it was the 1950s. And this is Texas. Texas in the 1950s. Not 1950s. This is in the like 19, early 1990s. Oh, 1990s in Texas. I mean, I don't know, but I imagine you, you could kind of stick your head out of the closet, but it wasn't entirely safe to come out right. for people. This guy, of course, fouls revenge. He is just pissed. He is like living. At this point, couldn't he just file for like slander, uh, you know, in his name and get like a bunch of money from her at this point? I mean, the police already hate her. <laughs> that seems like a better idea than murder. Yeah, but she's also won several lawsuits and she has a law degree. Yes, but the police <gasps> hate her. Yes, but he stole from her. Okay. So... I, I don't know. On August 27th, Madeline, her son John, and granddaughter Robin go missing. Their three dogs are left behind in the house. Oh no. Now, what happened to the dogs? Okay, I did some research on this, and um, the dogs were okay. Okay. Sort of. The dogs are okay? Sort of. Um, what does sort of mean? 
To sort of mean they died? So, a guy moves into the house. I don't know. They weren't tortured. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> well, <laughs> Basically, somebody with the American Atheist moves into their house to house it and dogs it. The dogs are in the backyard one day. Two of them, John Garth's dog and Robin's dog, go missing. No. I don't know. I could not figure out what happened. That was just in one article I read, but okay. I'm not entirely certain. He was quoted as saying, if you follow the dogs, you'll find them. Now, it'll be noted that the dogs were not found with them later. Oh, good. I so, mean, I don't I actually know what happened to the dogs, but Madeline's dog was still with a guy. Okay. I was no. spiraling, man. <laughs> Now, she loved dogs more than she loved people. And, like, those dogs went with them pretty much anywhere. And they were left home alone. Either they were left home alone or they were left at a kennel because they had been on vacation. And, ironically, she didn't take the dogs. They wouldn't have been. They were, like, scheduled to be picked up. I'm not entirely. It's saying some of the dogs are a bit vague. But what I do know is that Madeline's diabetes medication was left at the house, as was their passport. The people come to their house, which is also the office for American Atheist. There's a note attached to the door saying that they have gone out of town on business and they will be back at some point in the future. They do not know how long they'll be gone. And nobody thought that was weird? I know. Some people thought it was a little weird because, one, the dogs were just left there and the passports weren't there and the medication was there. And now there's a note on the door. And they had just come back from vacation. And now there's a note on the door. Yes. Here's the reason that no alarm bells are basically go off right away. They called the cell phone, John Gar's cell phone, and they're like, he answers. Oh, okay. He goes, "We're, we're, we're on business. We, we got called away urgently. We're going to be gone for a while. So and were they not kidnapped at this point? Between August 27th and September 29th, the people with American Atheists continued to get calls. Okay. And make calls. On September 29th, around 4 o'clock is the last time anyone from the American Atheist hears about the Murray O'Hares. Is that when they get kidnapped or when they get, Mm-mm. you know? They've been kidnapped this whole time. Okay. They were kidnapped for like a month. But I mean, I, I was on the trail for the kidnapping, but then you said they were calling. Yes, they were calling. It was literally kind of covering tracks. Okay. Okay, I'll get to it more towards the end. Okay. Now, what the American atheists realize is that $600,000 has been withdrawn from a bank account in New Zealand. The Murray O'Hares didn't just have some offshore bank account. This bank account in New Zealand was kind of a collection fund where over the course of five years, they had been trying to raise a million dollars. $600,000 is kind of what was left, but they, they accomplished that, I think. It wasn't something like they necessarily had access to all this money all the time. The American atheists, now this is what gets me. They're kind of like, oh, okay, I guess they decided to take this money and go retire. So they were just okay with the idea that, yeah, somebody else takes over and um, just kind of goes, you know what, it's fine. Some people speculated that because of her diabetes it had gotten worse and Madeline was sick and had gone off somewhere to die so that Christians couldn't pray over her. That Um, seems silly. Indeed. Now it does seem some people try to reach out to the police but the police are like Meh. So it is literally a year later when Estranged Son Bill here he goes, you know, I haven't seen mom on the TV for a long time. <laughs> Plus, he found out that somebody has been staying in his mom's house. Again, it's like I don't know. The you. guy watching the dogs and all that. Wait, um, the guy just watching the dogs is like, this, this is, is fine. Cool. Everything's <laughs> fine. <laughs> We're now, fine. Now, there was also some issues with the IRS. And he wasn't freaking out that he lost two of the three dogs. I mean, as a house sitter and a dog sitter, Doing I would be horrible flipping to- out. I really wish I could tell you more information, but I'm not even sure I was able to find this guy's name. <laughs> I'm sure if I dug deeper, I could have found his name, but he didn't seem all that important. <laughs> you didn't think I would get stuck on the dog watcher? <laughs> I, I knew you would get stuck on the dogs, but I didn't think you'd get stuck on the dog watcher. I want to know who he is <laughs> right now. Google it yourself, bitch. <laughs> Bill, in 1996, files a missing persons report. Initially, it's not taken seriously. 
uh, because you have three adults who have absconded with six hundred thousand dollars. They're just kind of like, it's cool. We don't care. But that's what gets me. Why don't you care? If somebody stole six thousand dollars from a charity organization specifically meant for like, well, the IRS cared. Yeah. Why? Why would you not call and say, hey, by the way, these people stole my money. Call the cops and have them investigate. A reporter named John McCormick, and he's the real hero in this tale, he's given the assignment to do a one-year anniversary story of the date they went missing. Right. He starts doing some digging. He finds out about the missing $600,000 and some phone calls. He discovers that the O'Hares for that entire month between August 27th to September 29th were in San Antonio. Making phone calls. Making phone calls. And on the surface, it doesn't look too out there for them have making plans to run. There's plane tickets to New Jersey there and back really quick. Now this is where he uncovers stuff that starts getting disturbing. Okay, so like trigger warning or not? Oh yet? no, not trigger warning just yet, but it just it starts making it realize like these aren't just three adults who have just run away. Okay. That it's something more sinister. He discovers that Robin's car was abandoned at, at an airport. Now, again, that particular, the car just being abandoned at the airport, could make sense if they had been looking up flight information to leave town. Right, and never come back. But remember, they don't have their passports. They did have $600,000, so maybe they could have gotten fake passports under fake names. In that month, John Garth also goes to a gold broker with the $600,000 with the intent to buy $600,000 worth of gold coins. Okay. So, uh, gold odd, odd choice, I know. Now, the guy thought it was a little, like, it was, it was a little strange, but not, like, the strangest thing. He talks about, you know, he didn't seem to know a whole, whole bunch about gold, and it took all day. McCormick also discovers that John's 1988 Mercedes-Benz, what was it, 89? Is 88 or 99? Mercedes-Benz, had been sold for $1,500. Now, the value of that car... Low? It was low. The value of that car was... Um, when I looked it up, it was either like somewhere around twenty to twenty-two to twenty-three thousand. Mm -hmm. This guy named Mark Sparrow, awesome name, thought that he was getting a really good deal on this car. Like, and it didn't even have like a super a lot of miles on it. You know, I mean, wow, it was like a good deal on this car. Now the police are sitting there, kind of going like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> Yeah, are you catching up, cops? <laughs> so Should we wait for them to catch up? <laughs> McCormick does this investigation for a good long while. He also uncovers that on October 2nd, 1995, a body washes up in a river in Dallas. Is it Madeline? The Trinity. It is not. It's a male body. It has no head is and no sun? hands. Oh, no head, no hands. You can't tell, can they you? They cannot identify it. The description of the body does not match. John. Oh, okay. Well, this body is unidentified for three years. Wow. And it's been three years? Yes. I kid you not. Their bodies are not found for five and a half years. And nobody thinks it's strange that they're gone for like five years? Well, uh, people are finally starting to look into it now. Three years later. <laughs> <laughs> three years later. The police are kind of like, okay, that is weird. That's that's actually really, really weird. So the police are like, you have the FBI who's now kind of like, okay, we have, we have a case here. There is something not right here. So the FBI starts investigating. So they just completely skipped the police altogether, went straight to the FBI. The FBI was Well, the like, Austin police were pretty useless in this. The, <laughs> um, the FBI was like, if you're not going to do your job, we'll do now, your job. Now, the Dallas County Sheriff's Office was actually doing their job. But, I mean, they had a headless, handless body, which, you know, didn't give a lot. It's not like they had anybody DNA-wise to compare it to yet. The FBI brings in Mark Sparrow, and they show him a picture of John Murray. And he goes, no, nah, that's not the guy who sold me the car. Okay. There was another man 
who went missing around the time the O'Hares went missing. He was a small-time criminal, not any real... I couldn't find out a lot about what his crimes were, but it was more like just petty stuff. Like theft. Like theft and whatnot. But there were also two others. Okay. A guy named Gary Carr. Mm -hmm. And our Walters dude. And our Waters dude. Waters dude. Waters. Not Walters. They were all three also in San Antonio around the same time as the Murray O'Hares. Now, David Waters actually contacts McCormick and says, Shh, I had nothing to do with that. I don't know where they ran off to. Did he know McCormick was looking for us? Well, yeah. He's, he's a reporter who's doing reports on all this. Okay. So he didn't just contact him out of the blue. No, no, he no. Was responding like, he to, was responding to stuff, or McCormick contacted article. him. He kind of did, like, a little, like, you know, interview, and he's like, no, I didn't have anything to do with this. You know, I haven't seen them since 1993. But he had motive. Okay. Waters did. Now, Gary Carr had been a cellmate of Waters in jail. Wow. I'm not entirely sure how they hooked up with Danny Fry, but but the three of them were in San Antonio at the same time as the Murray O'Hare family. Okay. When Mark Sparrow is shown a picture of David Fry, he identifies that as the man who sold him the car. Now, David Fry has been missing for three years at this point. Did we find the body? The body that washed up in Dallas with the help of his brother was proven to be him through DNA. Wait, wait, wait. So he helps these other two guys kidnap Madeline and her family and then they kill him? Yes. I'll get into that in a little bit. Suspense. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. In 1998, the FBI executed a search warrant on Waters' apartment and also Gary Carr's apartment. So now they have Danny Fry, who is dead. They can prove this is his body. He was last seen with these two. The Madeline O'Hares were in the same area. We have the dead guy selling, selling the car. Yeah. So it looks really, really suspicious. And at this point, they're certain that the Madeline O'Hares are probably dead. And did the reporter just go, uh-huh, where are them, Waters? Where are they, Waters? <laughs> no. Um... Now the FBI kicks in and is actually doing their job. Oh, okay. The, and I think the police That's are, when the FBI was called well, in? Well, the FBI had been called in at some point. Right. Um, but a search warrant is executed on their apartment. They find guns. So they are arrested for weapons violations because they are ex-cons who are not supposed to be in possession of weapons. Are they on parole? They are. Or so they're violating. They're ex-cons. Yes, they're violating parole and other things. They're not supposed to be in possession of weapons, so they are arrested on weapons charges. Okay. And they're held. An ex-girlfriend of David Waters comes forward, and she says in September 1995... He had a storage unit. Ooh. They searched the storage unit, and after three and a half years, they find a very tiny red stain. Does he never clean the floor? He missed this one. Okay. They actually did DNA test on it. Who is it? It turns out to be Madeline Murray O'Hare. And her son's mixed blood. Oh my, okay. So, so it was both of them. It was a, it was a small, minute amount of both of their blood. They also found in the search warrant, warning, when they executed the search warrant, Trigger little, warning. Tri little warning here, they found a bow saw. What's a bow saw? Um, it's a saw that kind of has like a little handle on it that's sort of shaped like a like a bow, like a bow and arrows. Oh, okay. I think so, I know what you're talking about. They find a bow saw, some other stuff that makes them really... They find a bottle, like, um, sort of for cleaning things. And it has... Like traces, bleach? Yes, it has traces of bleach in it. So they believe that the bone saw was used to dismember the bodies, and the bleach was used to clean up the storage unit. Okay. So he didn't get rid of the bow saw. <laughs> no, Three he years, didn't. He didn't. He still had it. Not the smartest criminal now, is he? Or the bleach can. Why hang on to a bleach can? For well, it, it's like a spray can canister type thing that's... I don't care. You use it, you get rid of it. I, I know, right? I, I, not the... Not that we're giving tips on how to murder somebody here. That's awful. Don't but, do it. <laughs> but get rid of the incriminating evidence. <laughs> 
Especially three years down the line. So it's not looking good at this point. Clearly. Gary is realizing that he's in some pretty hot water. Which one's Gary? Gary Carr. Oh, Carr. Not so, Waters. Carr. Not Waters. Carr. Waters so, is the big bad guy, and Carr is the uh, cellmate. Yes. Okay. So Carr, in 1999, Carr winds up drawing a kind of rudimentary map of a basicest of basics location of where they hid the bodies, but they don't actually find them based on his map. He is convicted of kidnapping, extortion, and weapons possession. Okay. Um, and he is, because this is his third strike and because of the third strike rules, he is given a mandatory life sentence. Now, David Waters takes a plea deal. Basically, he's given immunity on murder charges. Immunity. Okay, so he can't so be like he, tried. So, he, he won't be tried for murder if he gives them the bodies. Okay. And in January of 2001. Which is five years later? Which is like five and a half years later. He leads them to where the bodies are. Trigger warning. Um, Major trigger warning. The bodies had been dismembered. Um, Their legs had been cut off, they speculate, for easier transport. Um, They could not entirely determine cause of death, but some sources I found said that they all three had plastic bags over their head. Others said only John Garth had a plastic bag over his head. But what I do know for a fact is John Garth had signs of blunt force trauma to his head. Okay, so they may have suffocated they may have or suffocated. hit them. Well, they definitely hit John Garth, and he did have a plastic bag over his head. Um, but it's likely they were all three suffocated. Okay. Also, with their bodies, they find the head and hands of Danny Fry. Oh, they found his head and hands? Yes. Oh, cool. I mean, not, not cool, cool, but like at least they can like put them back together. <laughs> right. That's so bad. They also showed signs of attempts at burning the bodies. Robin's skull was found with her hair still intact in a braid. Oh. Now, the article I read said a female skull, but um, if you look at pictures of Madeline. Her hair is too short, but Robin has this long, beautiful hair. Right. So you know it had to have been Robin. They are identified through dental records, but also Madeline had had a hip replacement. So the serial number on the hip replacement was able to positively identify them. Okay. Waters led them to the bodies. He confessed. Now, nobody has ever actually been charged with their murders or the murders of Danny Fry. What? Because he took the plea deal and... Yeah, but what about Carr? He was already convicted for life in prison. So they didn't Because bother. of kidnapping. So there was no point. We have a basically a good idea of what happened. They took them to a motel in San Antonio and they basically kept them there for a month. They rented a two-bedroom hotel. I don't know entirely all of what happens. Pharmacy records show that they were got her diabetes medication. Food was brought in. They weren't treated too horribly, maybe, during so they that were time. Taken care of. They were taken care of. Now, John was forced to transfer money from New Zealand to an American bank account. Now, in order to actually get it, he had to go in person. He had to fly to New Jersey. So one of them goes with him to New Jersey. He could have gotten away then. But remember, they have his mother and his niece Mm. hostage. So even if he got away, they would have murdered his mom and niece, and he didn't want to endanger them. And they thought they could get away at this point. Yeah, they they were... They were led to believe that if they just went along with it, they weren't going to be harmed. That they would be let go. Yeah. They fly to New Jersey and they get the money and then they come back. Money like that can be traced. A large amount of money. It can be sequenced. It can be traced. That's why the gold coins. Oh, because gold coins can't be traced. Gold coins can't be traced as easily. Kind of smart, but kind of like... A random sort of choice? Yeah. On September 29th, or 28th or 29th, um, John goes with some of his captors to go and get the gold coins. Now, they tell him, we only have 500,000 of them. You'll have to come back in a week. He never comes back for the other 100,000. They are moved to a different hotel, and it is here... They are murdered. We can speculate that maybe they just decided we can't keep this charade up much longer. 
Um, now, what I do know is Danny Fry had been telling his brother things. He told him, I'm holed up in this hotel. I'm watching these people. I'm not getting much sleep. Okay. And he also said that he had a gun. And his brother's like, why do you have a gun? He goes, well, it's Texas. Mm -hmm. Now, Danny Fry was originally from Florida. Okay. Yeah, Florida man. They kill them, whether they blunt force trauma or they suffocate them. They're killed. Their bodies are then transported to the storage unit where they are dismembered. It is around the same time that they decide to kill Danny. Why? Now, he was a known alcoholic. They were afraid that he would talk. And so, he clearly did because of the brother. He so called they, the brother. Exactly. So they decided that the best thing to do would be to kill him. So they did. And when they drove out to a ranch, I don't remember what it was called, they buried David Fry's head and hands with the O'Hares. They decided to behead him and take his hand so that you don't have dental records, you don't have fingerprints. So his body would just be unidentified. Right. They, um, and he would show up in the river not too long after. And he would after. show up. He, so that was on September 29th is when they died. But aren't they in San Antonio? They drove to Dallas oh. and dumped his body. Okay. So literally, they did their last heard from on September 29th, and that's the day they died. Danny Fry's body washes up in Dallas River on October 2nd. So just a few days. Okay. David Waters, he's in prison. He's given 60 years. He dies in 2003 from cancer. How many years is that? Like he was, he felt, helped them find their bodies in 2001. Oh. So he served two like years. Two, years. two years. So as far as I can tell, Gary Carr is the only one still in prison. That sucks. So now. Especially since Waters was like, I think he was the he mastermind. He was the mastermind. Yeah. Here is the really big twist in this case. Okay. Remember Remember those $500,000 worth of gold coins? The ones that they got so that it wouldn't be traced? Uh-huh. Yeah. The captors put those gold coins in a suitcase in another storage locker. Okay. So around this time, there are some thieves going around raiding storage lockers. No, they don't have, tell me. They have a master key, and they take the suitcase. You have these three... Wait, they... Killed three people for these gold coins, and they don't even get the gold coins. Nope, nope. <laughs> Those so, are some lucky thieves. I mean, so, not the original thieves, but the new thieves are so very lucky. They literally are like, don't know what they have, so they go to the library and are trying to figure out the value of these gold coins, and they go on a spending spree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're like living it up. We're talking, we're talking like prostitutes and fancy clothes and parties <laughs> and just all of this and one gold coin is given to a necklace as a relative of one of the thieves. Oh, that's cute. And it is actually in um, 1999 the FBI calls for the um, last gold coin to be recovered and it's the only one. How were they able to trace the gold coin? Um, I don't know, but they did. I I couldn't find the names, but I know they were they were known. Okay. So like that they just went on the TV and they were like, hey, if you stole gold coins, can you please let us know? I think they were able to catch the thieves because they weren't real um, good at what they were doing. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, so here's my way of thinking. That's Madeline's last ha. <laughs> okay. So she's like, you fucking killed me, mm -hmm. but you will not spend my money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah they were cremated they were buried in an unmarked grave despite the estrangement that he had from his mother he did make sure that there were no prayers mm -hmm. like they're in an unmarked grave so that it can't be ridiculed it can't be made a martyr kind of thing so he kind of did give her honor, what she wanted in the end yeah honored that in the end that was the story of Madeline Marie O'Hare. Wow. And that was her a... um oh, there's one thing I forgot. So somebody was charged with renting the storage unit for David Waters. Okay. So that's not all that important. Wow, that was a bit of a twist. Some twists and turns. Ja. This woman who kinda changed the landscape of school as we know it. Mm-hmm. You know, and the world. She a bit like Typhoid Mary, 
Mm-hmm. She fought a she system. she fought a system that she thought in ways was corrupt. She was you know stubborn to the end. A bullheaded woman. Yep. So wow. all right. Well, we'll see you guys next time. I don't know what we're going to be doing next time, so it'll be a surprise yeah, for us all. Yeah, we haven't had any. Uh, we, we, we have a few ideas, but we haven't decided on anything yet. Don't forget, you can find us on Instagram, and Facebook. Facebook, and Twitter. Bye! Bye! Bye.